There are five things that Paul tells us about him in this passage. Number one, he is the image of the invisible God. What that means is that Jesus was not just a really good man who God approved of. He he wasn't just a guy who knew a lot about God so he could tell us the truth about God. No, he was God. He was divine. Yes, fully human, When Jesus worked in the hot sun, he sweated. When Jesus worked all day, he was tired. Jesus got illnesses. He he experienced all the full range of human emotions. He was human, and yet he was fully divine. And he made no secret of this. There's a moment when the Pharisees are arguing with Jesus, and they mention Abraham. We are sons of Abraham. You You can't tell us what to do. And Jesus says, before Abraham was, I am. And they picked up rocks to stone him to death because that was heresy. Not only was he saying, I've been alive since before Abraham, which is thousands of years earlier, he's using the name Yahweh, I am, for himself. There's another moment when Philip, one of the 12, says to Jesus, Lord, just just show us the Father and that will be enough. He's essentially saying, we've been with you three years and we've heard you talk about God. Now let us actually see God. And Jesus says, Philip, you've been with me all this time. Don't you get it? If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. And then there's all these other things he said, like, I am the bread of life. If you eat of me, you'll never be hungry again. I am the resurrection and the life. If you trust in me, you don't have to worry about death. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And and I could name many others. My point is, If any other human being said things like that, we would say, get as far away from that person as possible. In his book, Mere Christianity, which if you're not a believer yet in Jesus, I highly recommend, even if you are. But in Mere Christianity, C.S. Lewis says, the one thing you can't say about Jesus and be accurate is he was a really good person and nothing more. Because... Really good people don't say the things Jesus said about themselves. People who say the things Jesus said about himself are either liars. Remember Jim Jones uh, a generation ago uh, and and that cult that he led that literally drank the Kool-Aid? That's the kind of person Jesus would be. Or or he's a lunatic. He's somebody, in in Lewis's terms, you got to love the British, he's on the order of a man who says, I am a poached egg. Right? He's a man of, of delusion, a man who just doesn't know reality. So he's either a liar, he's a lunatic, or he's Lord. He's exactly who he said he was. You have to decide. But the one thing you can't say is, I don't believe Jesus was divine, but I really admire him as a good person. That's not possible. Jesus, in fact, it says, verse 19, that in him all the fullness of God dwelt. John, in John chapter 1, tells us the same thing, uh, that God became, took on human flesh and dwelt among us, and that was Jesus. And the really good news is we're all curious about what God is like, and we all have our opinions, but all you really have to do is read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and you will see God in human flesh walking on earth. You'll see how God responds to people who are sinful, like you and me. You see how God responds when he sees human pain and struggle. You'll see how he responds to people who are rich and powerful and oppressive, how he treats the bullies, how he responds when people doubt him or criticize him, all of these things. And the really good news is when you read the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, if you're like most people, you read that and you go, yeah, that's, that's who I want God to be. And that's good because it is. So he is the image of the invisible God. Number two, he is the creator and sustainer of all things. Verse 16 says it this way, for by him all things were created. In another part of the Bible, in John 1, 3, it says, through him, that is Jesus, all things were made. Apart from him, nothing was made that has been made. And that confuses a lot of people because we think that, that, okay, God the Father, and then Jesus is the Son, and so God the Father created everything, and, and Jesus the Son was just sort of sitting there saying, go dad, but that, that's not the way the Bible presents it. And what I'm about to say is, it's taken me a long time to understand, and I don't fully understand it, but I'm going to say it anyway because I know it's true, and that is Jesus is not God's son in the same way that I am the son of Homer and Betty Berger, okay? 
Uh, there was, God doesn't have a wife. There was never a day when, when God went to the hospital where Mrs. God had just delivered her bouncing baby boy and handed out cigars. Okay. This is not, it's not God. Jesus is not the literal son in that sense. It's, it's a way of describing it so that we can understand that there is one God and yet there are different persons within the Godhead. And so God the Father, God the Son, God the Spirit are distinct, and yet they're one. Jesus talks about it in John 17, night before he died. Father, I, I can't wait to get back to the, the union we had, the fellowship we had before the world began. And that means that because there are three in one, that means that what one does, all do. And so Jesus was part of creation. Jesus created everything, including you, including me. Not just that, though. It says that he created thrones and dominions and rulers and authorities. That's talking about the unseen forces, including those evil forces. Have you ever met highly religious people who are just terrified of demons? And that was the case in, in Paul's day. And Paul says, don't worry about that stuff. Jesus is more powerful than them. He created all things. He is the Lord of all. But then it says, in him all things hold together. What does that mean? There's a, an old theologian, J.B. Lightfoot, who said it this way. He said, he is the principle of cohesion who makes the universe a cosmos instead of a chaos. I like that. I wish I'd said that. What does it mean? I, I, I don't know. Not fully. What I, what I think it means is that if Jesus wasn't holding the universe together, if he wasn't active in the daily operations of creation, everything would fall apart. And that means that every good thing that happens in your life and in mine, every experience we have that is a blessing, every, every good thing we have ultimately comes from Him. And so it is very right and good and true for us to thank Him whenever something good happens. He sustains all things. He creates all things. Number three, here's where we get down to earth. He is the head of the church. Christ is head of his body, the church. It's interesting, we use the word church to mean lots of things. You might be driving through downtown Conroe this week because you got a ticket, you don't have to tell us, but you, you're driving into downtown Conroe, going to the courthouse, and you go, oh, hey, there's my church over there, referring to this building, right? That's one way you use that term. Or you might say, um, oh, Sunday morning, I'm going to church at 1115, referring to an event that you go to once a week. Or you might say, I am a member of First Baptist Church, referring to a particular institution. But when Jesus and the apostles in Scripture use the term church, ecclesia in Greek, they're never using it in any of those ways. Instead, they refer to it as a group of people that are considered the body of Christ. And I want to be clear. First Baptist Conroe is part of the body of Christ. But the body of Christ is bigger than First Baptist Conroe. It includes churches of every nation, race, tribe, and tongue, and every denomination you can name that proclaims Christ as Lord, including denominations who do things completely different than us. But that's the body of Christ. So, so think about it this way. I mean, it's over and over again in the Scriptures. We are the physical presence of Jesus on earth, corporately together. Therefore, therefore, if Jesus is going to do something in this world to solve the problems of this world, he's going to do it through his body. And that makes the local church the most important institution on the face of the earth. Now, that may be surprising to you. You may think that the church doesn't get a lot done. Well, that's because we're not living up to our head. We're not making him preeminent. But that is our job. That is our role. That also means two things. For people like the young woman I mentioned at the beginning, who are walking away from the church, Jesus says, but don't you understand, this is my body. Don't you understand, this is how I am rescuing the world. Don't walk away. And for those who say, well, I, I like Jesus, I just don't like the church, he would say, yeah, but you, you can't do it that way. I mean, you wouldn't tell someone, another part of the scriptures, he says, the church is my bride. You wouldn't tell somebody, I really like you, you're my friend, I can't stand your wife. You don't have the option. It is a package deal. Jesus is 
the head of the body. But he's also speaking to another group, and that, is, that includes a lot of us who are here this morning, people like me who are heavily invested in our local church. Jesus is saying, remember, it's my body, not yours. You're not in charge, I am. In a few weeks, uh, the ministry staff and I are going to go off uh, on, a, on a staff retreat. We do this once a year. and We evaluate how things are going. We set goals for the coming year. A few weeks later in October, I'm going to go away from my annual week where I, I plan out next year's sermon, the whole, whole year's sermon calendar. And in all these things, I am doing what I feel like God has called us to do. We're doing what we're called to do as, as, as uh, leaders of this church. But we understand, and I hope you do too, that when we stand up and say, okay, here's what we think God is leading us to do, we're not in charge. We're trying to interpret His will, but we know that He's the head, not us. This is not my church. It's also not the deacon's church. It's not the life group leader's church. It's not the church that belongs to whoever gives the most money, whoever that may be. It's not the, it doesn't belong to the people who've been here the longest. It doesn't belong to people who've come from bigger churches and think they know how things should happen. I mean, all of us have our opinions. The good news is the Bible gives us guidance and can answer most of our questions for us, but on that tiny percentage of things the Bible doesn't directly address, where we disagree, where we butt heads, which we will, let us always, always remember it's His church, not mine, not yours. He is ultimately in charge. And that should make us humble when we disagree. Humble enough to say, this is what I believe. You may be right. Let me listen to you first. And let's pray and come to an agreement. Let's move forward together in one mind. He is the head of the church. Number four, He is the firstborn from the dead. There are two times in this passage that Jesus is called firstborn, and that does not mean, in verse 15, he's called the firstborn of creation. It doesn't mean there was a point where Jesus didn't exist. You and I can say, you, whatever your birth date was, you can say, there was no me before that day. And we're right. But with Jesus, he has a physical birthday because that's when Jesus came into the world, but he has always existed. So when it calls him the firstborn, it doesn't mean there was a time when he was not. It's using the term firstborn in the way the ancient world used that term. In the ancient world, as unfair as this sounds, it was established practice that the firstborn son in every family would be in charge of the family when dad passed away. So to be the firstborn was a, a position of privilege, of power. It's calling Jesus the firstborn of creation because it's saying he's the one, he's the man, he's in charge, he's the king, he's the one who ultimately decides. But then in verse 18, when it calls him the firstborn from the dead, then it's using it in a completely different way. It's saying he's the first one to ever conquer death. You can find examples of people in scripture who were raised from the dead, but then they later died again, which has got to stink. Hooray, I've been brought back from the dead. Good news, you get to die again. Dang it. Jesus never experienced that. Jesus conquered death. He rose from the dead. No one rose him. He rose from the dead and then ascended into heaven where he sits at the right hand of God in his resurrection body. Jesus is the trailblazer for us. And that means that we know that death has no hold over us. And it's interesting when you read the book of Acts, which is essentially, the, the Acts is what happened in the 20 or 30 years after Jesus was gone. And the church spreads throughout the Roman world, and on the apostles, Peter and Paul, and, and all the apostles are going out and they're spreading the message. And what do they keep talking about? What do they keep saying? They don't walk up and say, hey, everybody, let me give you this little simple prayer you can pray, and then you go to heaven when you die. What they keep pray, preaching instead is, let me tell you about Jesus who was risen from the dead. That's the key. That's what everything hinges on. Because if Jesus rose from the dead, as Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, if Jesus rose from the dead, then he is who he said he was. If he is who he said he was, then when he died on the cross, he wasn't just one more innocent victim of the Roman Empire. No, he was triumphant. He was taking our sins upon himself, just like he said. And therefore, you and I can be saved. And therefore... He should be preeminent. In fact, that's what Paul says in verse 18. He says, because he's the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. He might be first in all things. In other words, 
it's really not an option, the way some of us think it is, to say, Jesus, I know I'm a sinner. I'm worried about the afterlife. So take care of my sins and save my soul so I can go to heaven. But leave my earthly life to me. If I want to sleep in on Sundays, uh, then that should be my thing. If I want to uh, have different priorities than you, then it's my life. If I want to chase my own dreams, you should leave me alone. I need you to save my soul, but leave my earthly life to me. That's really not an option. That in all things he might be preeminent. If he's risen from the grave, he's Lord of all. If he's not Lord of all, he is not Lord at all. Tim Keller passed away a few months ago, but for many, many years he pastored Redeemer Presbyterian in Manhattan, New York. And so he often had people come to his church who had never been in church in their lives, had no concept of what Christianity was. And he'd have a similar conversation over and over again. People would come to him and they'd say, listen, um, I, I didn't know anything about your beliefs before this, I I thought you guys were probably crazy, but after having been here a few times, now that I see, I kind of like what I see in you. I I wish I had what you had. I'm interested in the Christian faith, but tell me something. I'm told, I'm told that if I become a Christian, I then I can't have sex outside of marriage. Is that true? And he'd say, oh, it's it's way worse than that, actually. (laughs) No, actually, if you, if you, except Jesus is your savior, then he becomes king of everything. Then, you know, every part of your life is submitted to his authority. And so there are things that you just, you just naturally tend to indulge in that all of a sudden you say, I can't do that anymore. Now Jesus is in charge. And people, these unbelievers would say, well, I can't do that. And he'd say, well, it's your life. You can do what you want, but let me just put it to you this way. Imagine that you had a terminal illness Your life was slowly wasting away, and a doctor came to you and said, great news, there's a new treatment that is 100% effective at curing your disease. You may die of something, you will die of something many years from now, but it won't be this. The only problem is, you can never eat chocolate again. What would you say? Would you say, oh man, never? Or would you say, hallelujah? You see, when we follow Jesus, yes, it changes our lives. And yes, there are things that we used to think we couldn't live without that all of a sudden we find ourselves choosing to live without. And they're replaced by better things. And even if they weren't, it would still be worth it because we're gaining life. Eternal life and real life right now. Because he's the firstborn from the dead. There is life found only in him. And then finally... Number five, he is the Redeemer. Years ago, 10 years ago, actually, there's a a documentary that came out. The title of it was The Man Who Saved the World. And I never got to see it, couldn't find it on any platform, but the title intrigued me, and so I looked it up. And it concerned a story that I'd never heard, and I bet you haven't heard it either. Back in September of 1983, before many of you were born, okay, okay, Better, better known as the good old days, all right? So in September of 1983, not because you weren't born yet. Don't take it personally. It was just fun being alive in the 80s. Take it from me. So Stanislav Petrov was a, an officer in the Soviet Army, and his job was to man a control panel in a nuclear weapons facility in Russia. His job was to monitor what the Americans were doing. One day, September 83, Petrov uh, finds all of his instruments alerting him that the Americans have fired four nuclear warheads at the Soviet Union. Now, his protocol is clear. He is supposed to immediately notify his superiors, who will then push that red button that will launch warheads at America. Millions will die, but that's the way it's set up. That's the system. Petrov does a very courageous thing. He says, I don't think the Americans would do that. That doesn't seem logical. I'm going to wait. I'm going to keep this to myself. I'm going to wait and see. And sure enough, after about 30 minutes, he saw there was no sign of any missiles, any any other further indications of anything wrong. And at that point, at that point, he told his superiors so that they would know this is malfunctioned. 
Now, instead of being treated as a hero, this guy who had saved millions of lives, the reason you haven't heard this story is the Soviets basically hid him, sent him into exile, because he was a symbol of their failure. If his story got out, if they gave him you know, the, the Medal of Lenin or whatever, um, then people would know that their system had failed, and that would be embarrassing. And so he was called by this documentary, The Man Who Saved the World. I'd love to meet him. But let me tell you about the man who really saved the world. Jesus didn't just prevent a war, didn't just save the lives of millions. Jesus made peace between God and humanity. Jesus opened the door so that anybody, this is why they call it good news, no matter what they've done, no matter how long they have left to live, no matter what they have to offer, anyone can have reconciliation with God the Father, can be uh, welcomed into the kingdom of God, can receive eternal salvation. The way verse 20 puts it, through Him, He reconciled to Himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of His cross. See, the really, really good news is that anyone can be saved. And not just saved from eternal damnation. I mean saved so that we reconcile not just with God, but with each other. Because of the cross, we can forgive each other. When you've hurt me, I can forgive you. And it sticks. Because of the cross, uh, it doesn't matter. Black, white, brown, yellow. There can be unity. We can love one another across those boundaries. So Jesus did something that is ultimately going to issue an ultimate world peace. It isn't there yet. You can look around and tell, but that is the end result of the cross. And think about how he did it. We think of heroes in triumphant terms. We think of heroes as being people who through whose strength or through determination and sheer will, they impose their will on somebody else. So think of George Washington crossing that frozen Delaware River to sneak up on the British and to win a great battle that brought us independence. Think of uh, the men who stormed the beaches at Normandy, facing that hail of bullets, and and established a foothold that conquered the Nazi uh, 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 Reich. Think of... Think of Abraham Lincoln when in the midst of the the Civil War, it would have been so much easier just to say, okay, South, y'all go your own way. We're going to go our own way. He said, no, the Union is too important. And he held on. And that's why we are a United States today. Think of Rosa Parks. She gets on that bus and says, today I am not moving. I don't care what the law says. The law isn't right. I'm going to stay in my seat because I'm a human being. By force of will, she won. The courts eventually said the laws down there are wrong, and society began to change. That's a hero in our eyes, and they are heroic, those people I just named. But Jesus did not not win the ultimate victory through strength. He, He won it through weakness. He won it through defeat. See, Jesus had all power. And when the soldiers came to arrest him in the garden, he could have called down legions of angels to destroy them in an instant but he didn't. When the the Sanhedrin, the the rulers, stood around him accusing him of things he hadn't done, you think about this, he knew those men. He had created those men. He could have pointed a finger in every face and said, let me tell you what your sins are, and your sins, and your sins, but he didn't. When Pontius Pilate, the representative of Rome, the most powerful empire on earth, tried to intimidate him, Jesus could have said, listen, let me show you what real power looks like, but he didn't. When he was hanging on the cross and people were spitting in his face and saying, come on down off that cross if you are who you said you were, don't you know he could have done it? But at every turn, at every turn, he stuck to the plan because he had you and me in mind. At every turn, he did what it took for the joy set before him. He endured the cross in spite of the shame. And he sat down at the right hand of God. And that's why we're saved. So, who do you say that he is? 